service everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Uh, I'm delighted to see all of you over Zoom, and I'm especially delighted to welcome Father Brad into our virtual pulpit this morning. We will begin our service with a musical prelude offered by our pianist, Joyce Gary.
Let us pray. Gracious God, as a star rose and drew people from great distances to Bethlehem, that they might greet the Christ child, draw us, your church, and all your people to you, that we might be the church and the people you call us to be. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may, may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time, grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, uh, uh, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you 
to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. <clears throat> if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at, at Nazareth. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm grateful to be with you today. Uh, thanks to Father Abel and Father Jim for inviting me. And as I have seen your faces pop up as you uh, signed up for this morning, um, so much uh, personal history there with you, sort of see my life passing in front of me. So good to see your faces. You know, we don't get to look at each other like this in the pew, do we? So I have this thought, if the human mind works something, something like a computer, we seem to run a program that one writer has called the pleasure-displeasure continuum. The program runs so fast that we're not aware of it, but it takes over our judgment and our life. We hear a word or experience an event that pleases us. We hear another word or experience and we're unhappy. Our facial expressions swing back and forth between a bright smile and a wrinkled frown. We gush and we growl. This vacillation between pleasing and unpleasing can be confusing and exhausting, but these alternating emotional inner states seem normal to us. So if you catch my drift, then you can understand what Jesus experienced when he returned to his hometown. When Jesus speaks words that pleased the Nazarenes, they praised him. The village people like this idea that the promises of the messianic age will be theirs. 
this affirms and blesses their self-centered focus. And because they are special people who live in God's favor, they are the people of God. The Messiah will come for them. And so we hear this spoken out. What gracious words come from this son of Joseph. We knew he'd do well. Welcome home, Jesus. When Jesus says things that displease the Nazarenes, the people attack him. And what is it that sparked this volatile reaction? Um, Jesus reminds the Nazarenes of an unpopular strand of Jewish tradition. The prophet Elijah saved an unnamed widow of Zarephath in Sidon from starvation during a famine. The prophet Elisha healed Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, from leprosy. Both persons were considered pagans because they weren't Jewish. Jesus suggested that God's blessings would be given to the Gentiles beyond the Jewish people. And this is one of the themes of uh, the Epiphany season, uh, the manifestation of the signs of Jesus beyond uh, his own community. And to make the situation worse, Jesus teaches that the Jewish people would be the ones to bring these blessings to the Gentiles. So as you heard in the end of the gospel, this unleashed an explosion of rage and the lynch mob gathers to take action. As our <clears throat> imagination enters the drama of Jesus' hometown teaching, it reminds us that our own minds really do work this way. Politicians know the frustration of currying favor with voters. People go up and down with their approval depending on if they feel enhanced or threatened by the direction things are going. Everything that protects their self-interest is okay. And we see this up and down of approval and disapproval in other people, but we miss how it is working within us. We see other people entrapped in this pleasure-displeasure matrix without seeing how it works within us. <clears throat> when I first came to this parish in 1981, I experienced affirmation and gratitude as we celebrated the centennial anniversary of the founding of the parish. At that time, it was a, a diminishing, declining congregation, but still faithfully supported by a remnant of, um, you know, really faithful people, a lot of them among pioneer Orange County families. After two years as rector, <clears throat> I could sense an optimism and positive spirit. But by 1983, I realized the Lord wanted this parish to welcome and include our Latino neighbors in our, uh, into our church because they were the majority of Santa Ana. So this meant I had to learn Spanish and get the vestry's approval for what would essentially become a local mission effort. Many of the new Latino members who came into the church back then were undocumented, which created a whole other set of negative reactions. And also we could see opportunities knocking on the door to provide space for local programs for children and youth and community organizing. The NOAA project became a thriving after school tutoring and activity center for over a hundred junior and senior high youth every weekday. Gang violence was a daily occurrence in the area. And we took part as founding members of OCO, uh, a local community organizing program with other churches 
to deal with local, local problems like traffic, homelessness, and gang violence. And some were enthusiastic <clears throat> about the new life and community involvement and others resisted. As the skin color of the congregation changed into a rainbow, there were flare-ups and walkouts, leaving our parish for more homogeneous congregations in Tustin, Orange, and Irvine. I remember several times when revered patriarchs who were like father figures to me and were my biggest fans when I first arrived burst out in anger and left the church after decades of faithful participation. I remember going home um, in deep depression some nights talking with Jan and, and she reminded me that more inner forces were at work within these persons. The specific issue they were reacting to was not the actual issue. So I'm remembering all of this from the past as I contemplated the gospel for today, wherein Jesus reminds the Nazarenes, God did not choose them to form a closed society and become the beneficiary of divine blessings of abundance. They were chosen to bring the benefits of the one God to all people. The focus is not on themselves, but what they can do for others. So we don't have to continue to play this, this ple pleasure displeasure continuum in our heads as we walk through our volatile, polarized and difficult world today. Inner attention is the way to free ourselves from this pleasure displeasure behavior Spiritual writer John Shea writes, quote, inner attention is a way to be free of this mechanical pleasing, displeasing behavior. We must learn to become aware of the pleasure displeasure program while it is running. This awareness will help us to modify the fierceness of our reactions and eventually to experience times when we can break free from its hold. But this is a long-term goal, something that becomes possible after uh, extended spiritual training, in quotation. So you know that contemplative prayer and the examine prayer where we review the past day with the Lord uh, are two ways to see what's going on in our life, to pay attention to those inner forces. But I think another quicker, more challenging approach is to join the good, no matter where it's happening around us, by lending a hand, see what happens to your heart. Join the good when we get nothing out of it, when we can't evaluate it as making us happy or unhappy you will notice a spiritual breakthrough for you when you can be joyful whenever and wherever the good is happening. Suddenly we'll feel no resentment for the widow of Zarephath in Sidon and Naaman the Syrian. We will rejoice that her hunger has been filled and his skin has been cleansed. And finally, the prophecy of human liberation, not just our own well-being, will be fulfilled in our hearing. Amen.
the prayers of the people. We pray for the wholeness, health, integrity, soundness, welfare, security, prosperity, harmony, and justice of all of the citizens of our nation. Almighty and sovereign God. Thy kingdom come. Help our nation develop a foreign policy that fosters peace, justice, equality, and freedoms that can advance the development, rights, and privileges of our global neighbors. Almighty God and sovereign God. Thy kingdom come. Move our nation to provide international leadership in the good stewardship of all the natural resources that you have entrusted to humankind. Almighty and sovereign God. Thy kingdom come. Loving God, hope of the poor and source of all health. Look with compassion upon your creatures who have suffered under the weight of this pandemic. Fill us with love toward our neighbor. Enable us as we strive for the common good and strengthen those who labor for our health. This week, we remember especially David Vasquez, longtime sexton of the Church of Messiah on the occasion of the first anniversary of his death. Almighty God and sovereign God. Thy kingdom come. We pray for those in our community who have asked for prayers. Douglas Sheridan, Tatiana Lublin, John Walker, Tyler Hudson, Wilfredo Estrada, Eric Corellius, D. Tucker, and Janet Harinawicki. We continue to pray for those named in the ongoing prayer list and for those we hold in our hearts. The parish is invited to offer additional petitions and thanksgiving, either silently or out loud. God hears them all. Loving God, as we move through our communal life together this week, may there be glory to you in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and evermore. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. God has made us one in Christ, he has set his seal upon us, and as a pledge of what is to come, has given the Spirit to dwell in our hearts. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Beloved Jesus, we believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. We love you above all things and know that you are with us. Since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into our hearts. Now and always, we embrace you and unite ourselves entirely to you. Never permit us to be separated from you. In your most holy name. Amen. Now, in the language of our own choice, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God, the Father who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. Amen. May God, the Son who turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. May God, the Holy Spirit, who came upon the beloved Son at his baptism in the River Jordan, pour out his gifts upon you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Let's go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. And good morning once again, everyone. It's great to see you. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit longer so that we can 
once again wish those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries this month um, to wish them well on, on their occasion of their birthday or, or their birthday or anniversary. Uh, remembering especially today, Claire Stoneman, Danny McGee, and Ignacio de la Puente. So uh, let's, let's give a round of applause to our Rector Emeritus for joining us this morning. It's great to see you, Father Brad. Great to see you. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to do a little bit more of Father Brad boosting. Um, Father Brad, and this was in the Episcopal News uh, uh, weekly update. But I just want to let you all know that next Saturday is part one of a workshop that Father Brad will be giving via Zoom um, on um, uh, his recent book on desert mystics. So uh, if you are interested, you are invited to um, register here. Um, and what I can do is I can, I will look for a link and put it in the chat um, while you are all in the breakout rooms so you can get it on, the, on your way back, okay? So next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, my other um, major announcement uh, is, of course, you should have received an email from me yesterday uh, announcing that we will be returning to in-person worship on February 13th. Um, this, again, was based on our um, uh, discussion and long deliberation over looking at the public health and epidemiological data uh, and while um, the variant is still out there, um, we are seeing positivity rates uh, drop precipitously. And our hope and expectation is that it will drop to a low enough rate that we can keep um, uh, people as safe as we can. Um, and we will, as I said in the, um, in, in the email, uh, we'll be uh, uh, doing things to keep ourselves space, safe in the sanctuary, including uh, enforcing mass discipline. Um, I recognize that for some of you, um, you don't yet feel safe and we want to honor that and we will try our hardest to make the Zoom experience as optimal as possible, knowing that, that this platform is not really set up for in-person live stream. Nevertheless, we will try our best and we thank you for your patience and your generosity. Uh, it's time to send you all into breakout rooms um, and uh, to chat and uh, check in with one another, make sure that we are okay or even better than okay. Um, and we thought that today's breakout question, and let me share my screen again, is for us to reflect on our epistle reading, this very famous passage from 1 Corinthians, uh, read at any number of wedding or other major, major events. Uh, many of us have heard this passage over and over. Um, and I wonder uh, what, what part of this passage particularly resonates for you today? What passage, which part of this passage strikes you as something perhaps that you've seen, or perhaps that you especially feel, or perhaps something that you feel like you need to work on a little bit uh, for yourself? So, uh, what dimension of love strikes you this morning? So let me go ahead and um, start up our breaker rooms, and we'll see you all in about 10, 12 minutes or so, okay? All right, see you back here. <laughs> 